Hey guys, are you ready to start a new adventure in our studies? We're going to take a look at the New Testament letters. They have a fancy word. It's called an epistle. Yes, an epistle is simply a letter. And often these New Testament letters are written to a group of people. That's why, as you know, the titles of them have a, a plural on them, right? The Philippians, the Galatians, the Ephesians. So there we have it. We're actually going through someone else's mail when we open the New Testament epistles. That's a federal offense, by the way. No, you won't do any jail time for opening someone else's mail in the Bible. But maybe that's a good segue. The letter we're about to read was actually pinned from prison. Are you guys ready to jump into the book of Philippians? So the purpose of this is to get a little bit of lay of the land about this biblical genre so that we can get more out of it, so we can hear more of what God was doing for these people and for us through this conversation we're entering into. Considering that we're coming into someone else's conversation, you might anticipate that we got to break this apart a little bit. Going through someone else's mail involves encountering the author, the recipient, and trying to understand why they're writing to them to begin with, because that often shapes how we understand what Paul, through the Spirit, is instructing, or whoever else is writing the letter. What is going on in the relationship between the writer and the audience? And that's, that's key. Have you guys ever heard your parents talk to each other on the phone? And you only hear one side of the conversation, and you try to guess what the other side of the conversation sounds like. It's a bit like that when you're going through someone else's mail. You're entering into a dialogue, into a relationship that's already there. Understanding that helps us to build a picture of what God is doing through this particular piece of mail. So since we're talking about letters, you'll notice as you're reading, you're like, oh, the Bible, this is great. This is God's instructions or it's God's textbook or whatever you end up thinking. I, I want to try to trying to break up some of those categories of genre a little bit. An awareness of genre style of writing helps us to understand what God is attempting to do through this unique contribution in the 66 books of the Bible. What is he doing through the format of the letter? You're, you're reading a, a piece of mail. If you sat down to write a letter, now I know many of us communicate with the rectangle and we tend to text and in, in sound bites and post and such that has its own rules of engagement and and so does a letter so if you sit down to write a letter well you would there's a format there's a style that you embrace and paul is writing in the style of of letter writing of his day and so of course he starts with a salutation you open up philippians and you are greeted by a salutation grace and peace. It's a common greeting for Paul. It would be convention after the salutation to introduce a, a word of thanksgiving. And so Paul very clearly thanks the Philippian church as I thank my God every time I remember you. Just such a warm welcome. That's significant because you look at some of these letters, say the letter of Galatians, and the thanksgiving section is actually absent. And actually it indicates Paul's frustration with that faith community. Knowing these pieces and what to expect help us to build a picture of what's going on in the relationship between Paul and the church community he's looking at, in this case, Philippi. And that helps us understand what God is uniquely saying to these people that we can mine and, and realize it's, it's for us to treasure as well. Well, then there's the body of the letter, right? And that's the bulk of it. If you look at the letter of Philippians, it's all the way from chapter 1, verse 12, all the way through 321. And that's the meat of it. Uh, the body is the biggest part of the letter, and that's where we, we, we get a lot of it. But understanding the shape of the body of the letter and how uh, what they're trying to accomplish and how they try to accomplish it, that's all part of gaining a little view of the texture of reading New Testament letters. There's also greetings. Isn't that interesting? The greetings are at the end. And oftentimes Paul will say, hey, can you tell this person, hey, uh, say hey to this person, say hey to this person, and he'll have some words of encouragement or some directions. And then the closing, uh, there's always this benediction, this blessing at the end. Now that you're a little aware of the parts of an epistle, these letter parts, and imagine if, if you wrote a letter, you would you would need pieces, right? There's, there's convention. You guys probably have to look up how to do resumes or cover letters or all that, and there's formats, and it's and it's helpful to know what to expect. What, what, what is the genre I'm picking up here? You read a, a 
an Instagram post differently than you read a textbook, and knowing what to expect of the genre helps us to, to make the most of it. The New Testament letters, and they were quite expensive to make letters at the time, so this was not a small deal. This wasn't as casual as a text message, and had to pack into these letters a lot of different things. You'll see some notes about logistics. Hey, send Timothy. This was a New Testament community. They were they were a church, and they had to figure some stuff out, tell people where to go, and this was their occasion to do so. So you'll notice that as you tarry through uh, New Testament letters. There's controversy. While, while Paul is doing a lot of encouraging work here and there and parsing through some theological questions and some other letters, there's also this constant sin of controversy, that there's something going on in the church that he needs to address, and, and it seems almost out of place here in Philippians. But Philippians 3, you see this, watch out for those dogs, and there's this presence of false teachers that you see kind of laced into these communications between uh, churches and church leaders. We, we see tiers of address. Sometimes he'll address a certain group of people, sometimes he'll address others, and even conflicts, right? It's interesting too because, I, I don't know if you guys realize this, but this would have been read out loud in the church service. So when specific names are mentioned, I mean, imagine getting a letter from one of your ministry leaders and they read it before the whole church and they air out the fact that two of you are disagreeing. Would that feel a little interesting? And it would have been read to the whole congregation out loud in one sitting. When is the last time you read an epistle in one sitting? So I think it would do you some good for you to actually sit down for 14 minutes. That's about how long it takes to read Philippians. It's not terribly long. Sit down and in one reading, you can go to the audio Bible online. Uh, you can find it on YouTube. Uh, there's different translations. And just sit and listen to the letter or you can sit and read the letter. Now's a great time to pause in your video, open a new window, and visit the whole letter of Philippians. All right, now that you're back, did you notice some of the means of communication? Did you notice that Paul wove into his letter a lot of different ways of talking about our faith, a lot of different subgenres within the epistle? So here's what I mean. He uses a lot of different styles of communication to let his point come across. And here in Philippians, we have a hymn. Yes, Paul actually uses what seems to be an early Christian hymn. So he's writing some favorite song lyrics down in his letter. Isn't that cool? He uses imagery, right? Metaphors and similes. Shine like stars. He uses polemic, which we might use the word a burn. He uses pretty strong language, calling them dogs. And there's reflection, right? There's a lot of person and personality in, in his letter. I, I have learned the secret of being content. Paul is putting a lot of personality and a lot of vulnerability in these letters. And again, it's all rhetoric. He, he uses phrases and turns of phrases and, 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 and leads people on a line of reasoning in order to try to see what he's trying to say. So after listening or reading to the whole book of Philippians, the whole letter, what do you think Paul is trying to say to the church in Philippi. Before we tarry there, one more thing to consider is the occasion. Did you notice something interesting about this letter? Paul is writing from prison. Now, some people debate as to which prison he was in. Was he in Rome? Was he in Ephesus? Was he in Caesarea? Paul spent a lot of time in jail, and it was in prison that he wrote this letter. As you were listening to the letter, as you were reading it, was there any words that jumped off the page? Were there any repetitions? What do you think Paul was trying to accomplish? What do you think his main message is? These are things that we can get a better sense of. Did, did the word joy come to mind or rejoice? Yeah, one of Paul's main messages in this letter is rejoicing. And that is striking given the scenario he is in, sitting in prison. Let's just take a look at this. We have in here uh, five times the noun joy is used in this letter. In one four, in all my prayers for all of you, I will always pray with joy. In one twenty five, I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. Two two, then make my joy complete by being like minded. Two twenty nine, welcome him in the Lord with great joy. Four one, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown. You see the repetition of joy. This is a key part of Paul's message. 
do you not believe me yet? Let's take a look at the verb form for joy. You ready? Rejoice. The important thing is in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. That's two times in the same verse. But even if I'm being poured out like a drink offering going on, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. 2.28, when you see him again, may you may be glad and I have less anxiety. 3.1, rejoice in the Lord. 4.1, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. 4.10, I rejoiced greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. So guys, if you haven't heard his message yet, just hear this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine times. And I know 228 here, my translation says be glad, but in the, in the Greek, it's the same uh, verb. And that verb is used nine times in the same letter. So have you caught Paul's drift yet? What does he want the Philippians to hear? What does he want the Philippians to do? He wants them to rejoice. So let me try to distill some of Paul's wisdom on this topic for us. And remember, consider the occasion. He is writing from prison. He is writing from jail. And so as we're trying to, to, to navigate how to read more richly the New Testament letters, all of these things help us to build a picture of what Paul is trying to convey. To rejoice is a choice. Now that rhymes. One can choose to rejoice no matter the circumstances, whether it's in prison, whether it's whatever they're dealing with, you can choose to rejoice. Now, I will say also that rejoicing does not ignore present pain or forbid lament. I want you to hear that. I don't think Paul is advocating for a thin joy or happiness or some sort of pretending that things aren't challenging. No, it's a richer joy. It's a joy that looks even beyond our current circumstance. The joy that's fixated on the very hope we have in Christ. And joy brings us together. Did you catch that? The, the, this togetherness and the familialness. This is a very joyful letter. It's a, a letter that celebrates the fact that this faith family has done well. We can be a part of one another's joy. Paul calls them his joy and crown. Man, do you feel that way about your fellow Christians? What if you were sitting in prison? Would you say that about each other? Guys, this close uh, relationship that Paul has with this church family indicates the kind of work Christ does in us. You see, Christian hope is not something that merely postpones our enjoyment, but it's one that transforms our enjoyment in the present, that we can enjoy the future hope we have in Christ and the present inheritance we have in one another, and the fact that we're participating in the very story of God. Those are things that bring great joy. So I hope this has helped you get a sense of some of the texture of a New Testament epistle. And in this letter, uh, we're looking at the way it's structured, looking at the conversation we're entering into. And maybe we can train ourselves to, to, to be more attentive readers when we're opening up scripture, to be aware of genre, to be aware of the way God is communicating something through the relationship these people have with one another. While Paul didn't write this letter to you, God inspired Paul and this church family to have the conversation we're entering into. And we too can take this message to rejoice no matter what is happening. So whether you're penning a letter from prison or whether uh, other hardships are shaping your life, we can cherish Paul's words here, that the life of Christ the life of living in Christ's example and in Christ's community as one that should stir in you a great sense of unbreakable joy. So look at the circumstances, look at the letter, look at the means of communication and internalize this message. I hope this has been helpful and I can't wait to join you for our next episode of Snail Mail Tales where we are trying to understand and to better read the New Testament letters. All right, Godspeed, and see you next time.